Good afternoon, everybody. This hearing will come to order. Uh, it's my honor to welcome everyone to the first hearing of this Congress for the Senate Environment and Public Works Subcommittee on Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife. I uh, apologize for the uh, slightly delayed start of the hearing. A vote opened on the Senate floor just a few minutes ago, uh, but I can attest that Lumis and I were among the first to cast our votes. We can race over here and try to begin as uh, on time as possible. Uh, we do expect additional colleagues to join us uh, over the next several minutes. Uh, today we'll be examining the issue of water affordability and small water system assistance in communities across the United States. There's a reason why there's a saying in the West that whiskey is for drinking and water <laughs> is for fighting over. Access to water is the foundation for strong and healthy communities, economies, and families. As a Californian, this topic is near and dear to me and to the 40 million Californians that I represent, as well as to all Americans who have ever had to worry about whether or not they could afford their next water bill, or if their water would be shut off because they can't keep up with the bills. In a country as wealthy as the United States, nobody should have to worry about whether aging, deteriorating pipes in rural communities will hold up, whether wells could dry, run dry due to an extended drought, or whether the climate crisis and extreme weather will bring catastrophe to our water supply. So it's only right that we take a close look at the state of our country's water systems and the federal investments needed to make sure that all Americans have access to safe, affordable, and reliable water supply. After all, it's not just about our economy and environmental protection. It's about fundamental health and human safety. So I want to thank our witnesses who are here today to discuss their experiences with America's aging water infrastructure, as well as with the families who are experiencing rising costs. I also want to thank Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and my subcommittee ranking member, Senator Lomas, as well as all of our hardworking committee staff for making today's hearing a priority. Now, when it comes to clean water, Americans too often face a heartbreaking choice. Just last fall, the Los Angeles Times told the story of Rosario Rodriguez, a woman living in a rural community in western Fresno County in California. With bills to pay, a family to feed, and a skyrocketing water bill after a summer of drought, Rosario was forced to choose between paying the electric bill or the water bill, not to mention food, school supplies, clothing, and more. And because there were few assistance programs available for water bills beyond one-time payments, she was forced to pay the water bill in full and look elsewhere for electric rate assistance. In 2012, California became the first state in the nation to recognize in statute a human right to water. But California can't do it alone. For the Rodriguez family and many families like them, extreme drought and the increasingly devastating impacts of our changing climate, combined with aging water infrastructure, have made access to clean, affordable water a privilege instead of a basic human right. This is the result in large part of decades of underinvestment in water infrastructure. Water systems, especially those in small, rural, or disadvantaged communities, also frequently lack adequate staffing and financial capacity to make necessary upgrades. As a result, the cost of maintaining and repairing water infrastructure has fallen on states, localities, and of course, ratepayers. In fact, over the past 20 years, water rates have increased at three times the rate of inflation, significantly higher than the rate of energy bill increases, for example. The American Water Works Association has found that one in three Americans struggles to pay their water bills on time and the EPA projects that 36% of U.S. households will not be able to afford drinking water by next year. That's more than one in three. This all points to an alarming water affordability crisis and an environmental justice crisis as well, 
with underserved communities who already struggle to afford utilities in rural, low-income, and tribal communities being hit hardest by rising water rates. So in this moment, we need a unified approach from the federal government to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable, clean drinking water. Over the past few years, I've been proud to see Congress come together to provide over $1 billion to help low-income households pay their water bills after the outbreak of COVID-19. I was proud to help pass the bipartisan infrastructure law, the single largest investment in water infrastructure in our nation's history, bringing an unprecedented $55 billion to communities across the country to bolster drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, replace lead pipes, and address forever chemicals known as PFAS. I was also proud to support this committee's work to authorize a new EPA pilot program to help rural and low-income households pay for water bills. Together, these are great first steps to lifting up families in need and investing in our nation's clean water future. But these are temporary rate assistance programs and investments that only begin to address the backlog of our deferred maintenance needs. So we cannot stop there. The $1 billion for utility assistance, for example, is set to expire this year. And despite the robust investments we made in LIHEAP, a permanent energy assistance program, we still do not have a permanent equivalent program for water assistance. And that's what today is all about, working together to see how we can provide permanent water utility assistance to communities in need and how we can make sure that no American has to choose between putting food on the table or pouring water into their glass. I'm excited to hear from all of our witnesses about what families are still facing, what communities and utilities see as the most pressing challenges to delivering affordable water, and how we can best strengthen our nation's water supply systems. And with that, I'd like to turn to Ranking Member Lummis for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Padilla. I look forward to working with you on the issues that we're discussing today, as well as other items such as reforms to the Endangered Species Act and to our work to ensure the continued supply from the Colorado River. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I especially want to thank Mark Pepper, who runs the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems. You're always such a help in informing me about what our small rural water systems are facing. So I'm deeply grateful for your being here today. You wear many hats in Wyoming, and I'm deeply grateful that you took time out to be here today because I know you're super busy. Water is the key to life. While this sounds like an overly simple statement for many Americans, it's a harsh reality. From droughts that constrain the supply to ever-increasing water bills, access to water is not universal across the country. In my home state of Wyoming, it's a constant struggle to keep water system operators to meet the needs of their communities, keep rates low while simultaneously complying with complex and evolving regulatory requirements from the EPA, and that's a challenge to our systems as well. Unfortunately, rural water systems have their own additional challenges. Small populations mean less ratepayers, which mean less revenue needed to make capital investments. I work with my colleagues on this committee to make significant investments in water infrastructure in the previous Congress, and I was pleased to see that effort included the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. However, Congress failed to make the investments in that bill in a fiscally responsible manner. If we are to continue investing in the needed infrastructure, Congress must find ways to ensure that we're not simply transferring our obligations to future generations. Outside of the capital investment needed, small systems also face difficulty finding, training, and retaining a workforce. Some estimates suggest that one-third of the water sector workforce will be eligible to retire in the next decade. That loss, not only of personnel, but institutional knowledge, will put tremendous strains on water systems across the country. And once again, rural America will be the first and hardest hit by these retirements. 
In addition to these items, I'd be remiss if I did not express my concern with EPA's actions as it relates to PFAS. PFAS compounds are designed to be durable and not break down naturally. As a result, these compounds can be found in water and soils across the country. While we're working to better understand the science behind this class of chemicals, it is clear they do pose a threat to human health. So I support EPA's actions to establish a national primary drinking water standard for the most common PFAS compounds. Every single American deserves the peace of mind that their water is safe to drink. But I'm concerned that levels selected by EPA at four parts per trillion will represent an unfunded mandate on water systems while not being supported by the science. That level represents not a health-based standard, but instead the level at which these compounds can reasonably be detected. For reference, four parts per trillion is roughly the same as four droplets in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. As one might guess, the detection and treatment technology needed to handle something at the scale will be costly, and those costs will be borne by the communities these systems serve. EPA must evaluate the academic literature from across the world when selecting the levels for these standards and not just rush to the costliest option. EPA is also proposing to designate those same PFAS compounds under CERCLA, the Superfund law. If finalized, water systems that are treating for PFAS may be held liable under CERCLA, again at the expense of the ratepayer. When CERCLA was first written, it was done using the polluter pays model. Water systems, however, are not polluters of PFAS, as they have never used those compounds. As such, it's imperative that we work here in Congress to pass legislation that clarifies that Entities such as water systems are not held liable for pollution to which they did not contribute. Thanks again for calling this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to turn to our witnesses. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Kyle Jones, who serves as Policy and Legal Director for the Community Water Center, an environmental justice nonprofit organization that works in rural and low-income communities in places like the San Joaquin Valley, which many refer to as the salad bowl of America. <laughs> Mr. Jones has a background in environmental law, land use law, and local government advocacy. Uh, he, Mr. Jones, you're a long way from Visalia, but uh, we know that you truly understand the impact that uh, the policy that we enact here in Washington have on the folks back home, and your voice and the voices of the communities you work with must be a part of this conversation. Let me also introduce Rosemary Menard, the water director for the city of Santa Cruz. Ms. Menard has served for over 40 years in public service, holding several water utility leadership positions in Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and Washoe County, Nevada. As water director in Santa Cruz, Ms. Menard has helped guide the Santa Cruz Water Department through multiple droughts, wildfires, repair and replacement of aging infrastructure, a pending water uh, treatment plant upgrade, meter replacements, and a plan to supplement the city's water supply and prepare for the ongoing effects of our changing climate. Thank you for testifying today. Uh, I look forward to hearing about the particular challenges and solutions water utilities are thinking about in the short, medium, and longer term. And I now once again turn to Senator Lummis to introduce Mr. Pepper. Pepper has over 43 years of finance and administration experience, 34 plus years in senior management positions and eight plus years in public accounting. He's been involved in surface and groundwater issues in Colorado, Nevada, Texas, and Wyoming during his career. Mr. Pepper chairs the Casper Area Economic Development Joint Powers Board. He also serves on the Wyoming Water Association Board of Directors and was appointed by the governor to follow, um, excuse me, appointed by the governor to the following current commissions 
or task forces, the State Emergency Response Commission, the State Qualification Review Committee, Governor's Non-Point Source Task Force, Governor's Small System Task Force, Governor's Special District Task Force, and is a member of the Governor's Solid Waste Citizens Advisory Committee. I don't know how you have time to do anything but go to meetings. He heads the state of Wyoming's largest utility membership organization that administers training and technical assistance programs enabling Wyoming's community water industry systems to meet the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Mark Pepper is a very knowledgeable and busy man. Thank you again for coming to Washington. I yield back. Thank, thank you, Senator Lummis. Um, as in, in this subcommittee, there's no requirement that we swear in witnesses, but we trust that the testimony shared today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And with that, Mr. Jones, your testimony, please. Well, good afternoon, Chair Padilla, Ranking Member Lumbus, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Kyle Jones. I'm the Policy and Legal Director with Community Water Center. And for background, Community Water Center started in Visalia, California, organizing uh, nitrate-impacted residents to help them understand what's in their water and what they can do about it. And has since expanded to focus on advocacy and direct technical assistance to support long-term community-driven solutions for the drinking water crisis in California. We also serve as a core member of the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus, a caucus focused on water equity nationally. And as noted in California, we recognize the human right to clean, safe, and affordable drinking water for all. And this is a necessary condition in order to ensure that there is economic development and self-determined futures for the communities that we work in. Many of the communities that we work in, unfortunately, are disproportionately challenged. There are many are small communities that are often failing to meet basic drinking water needs. California alone has 395 failing water systems serving over 800,000 people. Uh, almost three million others are in systems that are either at risk of failing or potentially at risk of failing. These systems disproportionately serve small rural communities and low-income communities of color. The residents we work with are also faced with increased levels of contamination. Uh, residents that we work with cannot use their taps for drinking water, and some can't even take hot showers without fear of getting sick or having increased risk of cancer. A particular challenge in the West is the increasing aridification and droughts fueled by climate change that is pushing us to have to rely more and more on less and less groundwater that is already being overpumped by agriculture. And as noted, many of these systems lack the technical, managerial, financial capability to access resources that are out there. These systems don't have the staff or expertise necessarily to navigate funding streams like the state revolving funds. And even if they could, uh, state revolving funds and bonds often can't provide a full solution as oftentimes operation and maintenance requirements can't be funded and thus make uh, solutions too costly for communities. And all this leads to more inaffordable water. Uh, the small communities with the rate payer, with small rate payer bases uh, face the, the highest rates. Uh, one community, El Porvenir in Western Fresno County that our partner organization Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability works with, has a fixed rate every month of $280. And that's before any volumetric charge for the use of water. And then further, because of contamination, our communities are paying twice for water once for the tap they can't use, and again for the bottled water they need to survive. It's unconscionable. Treatment costs are also going up. Uh, and we're facing a solution where communities are either forced to choose between water that's safe or water that's affordable. But we believe in the United States that we can provide both. And affordability problems are, uh, sorry, affordability programs are not universal like they are for other utilities like energy, gas, food. Uh, safe drinking water is a necessity, and whether or not a family can afford their water should not be based on their zip code. And the affordability crisis really came to a head during the pandemic. California had over a billion dollars in water debt as a result of the pandemic, and wasn't alone. And while we've been successful in crafting some solutions focusing on debt, we're not addressing the, the root of the problem, which is unaffordable water rates. So what are the solutions? We believe there needs to be continued and expanding investments in water infrastructure with a focus on removing barriers that limit access for small water systems. 
And this includes things like expanded outreach and engagement to ensure that small rural communities have projects that are ready to be funded when, fun when infrastructure programs are available, uh, and also funding to solve operations and maintenance. We also encourage Congress to look at other ways to fund drinking water, such as rural development at USDA, uh, the Bureau of Reclamations programs. And then we also need a low-income water assistance program. We need sustained funding to make sure that water is affordable so that folks don't fall behind and get into debt. We can't create a program alone as a state. We need support from the federal government. And so we urge the creation of a LIRA program this year uh, and in addition, extension of LIWAP to ensure that in the meantime, there's still some assistance for families in need. We also ask for reforms to the LIWAP program to ensure it can be more successful for states like California. We recognize that there's a human right to clean, safe, and affordable drinking water for all, and we urge Congress to join us and work towards fulfilling this human right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Bernard. Chairman Padilla, Ranking Member Lemus, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Rosemary Menard, and I'm the director of the Santa Cruz Water Department. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you my perspective on the important uh, issue of the affordability of water and wastewater rates. The Santa Cruz water system serves just under 100,000 people through 27,000 connections. We own, operate, and maintain a complex water system to produce and deliver treated drinking water uh, that's both groundwater and surface water from those sources. Most of the system's major facilities are constructed before uh, 1960 and have reached the end of their use, useful life. In addition to our aging infrastructure, we're challenged with impacts of our water supply and infrastructure from climate change fueled extreme drought conditions and severe storms while maintaining compliance with the sta state and federal drinking water standards. Meeting these various uh, responsibilities comes with a cost that's ultimately borne by our water customers who pay their bills. Uh, to ensure uninterrupted quality service for our customers, Santa Cruz has developed a multi-year capital investment program, or CIP, that currently has a $650 million price tag. To pay for the CIP in 2016, a uh, long-range financial plan was developed that had a project funding strategy that was heavily uh, focused on debt, um, debt financing. To cover the cost of the CIP, the Santa Cruz City Council unanimously approved significant rate increases in 2016 and again in 2021. The 2021 rate increase schedule is now being implemented and includes a 16% rate increase uh, in both July of 23 and July of 24. Looking ahead, we expect to have continued rate, rate increases through at least the next decade to address the issues uh, in our water system as they continue to age and we deal with the climate challenges. While our investment and rate increases to, and the rate increases to pay for them are necessary to maintain and upgrade Santa Cruz's water system, we recognize their effects on our customers, particularly those at the lower end of the income scale. Today, our data show that about 20% of the households we serve are already heavily financial burdened, financially burdened by their water and wastewater rates due to about a 250% increase in the cost of water since 2014 and also an anticipated additional 50% increase by 2026. This is where the federal low-income uh, water customer assistance program could play a vital role. Santa Cruz is unable to provide rate assistance through a statutorily uh, requirement, statutory requirement in the state of California that prohibits us from using rate revenues from one set of customers to provide resources to subsidize the cost of service to another set of rate customers. Um, we are uh, one of many states that have that prohibition, and there are a number of other states in our um, in the country that where there's a gray area legally about whether utilities can actually uh, use that form of rate revenue to provide rate assistance. So it discourages water utilities from attempting to stand up such programs. So this is why the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program, LIWOP, that you just heard about, was so critical uh, when Congress established it during the pandemic. For the first time, the federal government offered direct support to help low-income households maintain essential water service, just as for years the LIHEAP program has provided for heating and cooling assistance. 
In, the, in Santa Cruz, as of January of 2023, the LIWAP program provided nearly $580,000 in funds to offset utility arrearages uh, and also to, um, to about 800 customers. And in the recent lifting of the California COVID area prohibitions against disconnections for um, non-payment, an additional 44 customers have received uh, some one-time assistance. These are really important um, benefits, but one-time assistance is only a problem, only solves part of the problem, and we need ongoing uh, problem or assistance. Um, looking forward, I would really ask Congress to consider multiple options for starting with uh, extending LIWAP through the next uh, fiscal year through 24 so that critical assistance can um, occur and also additionally to consider how the um, bipartisan legislation that allowed for the EPA pilot program to develop might be funded and provide an opportunity for there to be um, some exp exploration of that program. I appreciate the opportunity to share Santa Cruz's affordability challenges with you today, but please remember that virtually every community in the country also has customers with similar water rate assistance needs. Now is the time to act to ensure their ability to access essential water services and wastewater services, and it's not threatened due to the cost. And I thank you for the opportunity to share my uh, testimony today, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Pepper, your testimony, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Padilla, uh, Senator Lummis, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to appear before you today on behalf of small and rural, small and rural communities. I'm Mark Pepper, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems, a nonprofit association representing all small water and wastewater systems in Wyoming. I'm also here to testify on behalf of the National Rural Water Association, which represents over 31,000 small and rural water systems across the country. Our member utilities have the very important responsibility of complying with all applicable Environmental Protection Agency regulations and ensuring the provision of safe drinking water and sanitation services to the public all day, every day. And the state revolving funds which provide federal dollars <clears throat> to small towns for building, expanding, and maintaining their drinking water and wastewater infrastructure were authorized by this committee, and thank you. One of the key aspects of our work at Rural Water is to provide direct assistance to small and rural communities in operating, governing, financing, upgrading, and maintaining their water and wastewater infrastructure. Local governments and nonprofit water utilities exist solely to serve the public's interests. They're directly accountable to their local citizens through local elections and are often governed by duly elected volunteer citizens. For the next few minutes, I'd like to discuss some of the most important issues facing small water systems right now, including affordability, the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, personnel challenges, and PFAS regulatory burdens. First, the two largest costs of most utilities are personnel costs and energy costs. Compounding these expenses are supply chain issues impacting access to chemicals for water treatment, the replacement expansion parts, and scarcity of qualified professionals like engineers and contractors. Inflationary pressures are also hampering affordability. This has had a stagnating pressure on personnel costs as operating costs have taken precedence. The SRF set-asides help to fill the technical gap by allowing qualified professionals to provide on-site assistance, comply with the myriad of federal Safe Drinking Water, Clean Water Act regulations, as well as access to supply chains and troubleshooting advice, which is helping to keep rates affordable. Should SRF set-asides be reduced or eliminated, I would suspect many systems will turn to unaffordable quickly. As for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, rural water systems are grateful to this committee and Congress for the enactment of this landmark legislation. However, we're hearing from a lot of systems and states that the funds provided in the bill have been slow to be implemented due to lack of supplies and engineers to do the work. Another quandary in Wyoming is that operators and agencies have questions with the definition of disadvantaged community. With the bulk of Wyoming systems serving under 1,000 people, they are at a socioeconomic disadvantage due to size, expertise, workforce, and a limited budget. We believe these communities should qualify as disadvantaged under the bill. 
We also believe an extension of time to get the money out based on the lack of supplies and engineers is warranted. We would also like the state match to remain at 10% for at least five years instead of just years one and two. The 20% match for years three and on may make spending difficult in meeting the match requirement. Regarding personnel, the water sector is facing critical staffing shortages with up to 50% of the workforce expected to retire in the next decade. The NRWA apprenticeship program is an essential tool being used right now in 35 states to address this critical issue. This novel initiative was specifically designed by industry leaders to attract, train, and retain the next generation of water workforce. These strategic partnerships have already created over 600 jobs for the water industry. Regarding PFAS, NRWA and WARS shares the committee's goal of eliminating PFAS from the public's drinking water and environment. However, the looming threat of EPA's proposed PFAS MCLs and the liability costs associated with having certain PFAS compounds designated under CERCLA could price small water utilities out of existence, which is why we are extremely grateful and express our strong support for S1430 introduced by Senator Lummis. The bill will preserve a fundamental element of environmental law, which is the important polluter pays principle for cleanups of PFAS designated under CERCLA. Finally, access to certified labs and subtitle B or subtitle C disposal facilities and the associated costs will further put strain on very thin operating margins. In closing, Mr. Chairman, small and rural communities thank, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today, express our thoughts, reservations, and acknowledge the numerous opportunities this committee has provided rural America in the crafting of federal water and environmental legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pepper, and all three of you for your testimony. We now turn to questions from the committee. And I get to begin. Aging infrastructure and deferred maintenance has left our water systems vulnerable, as I think we've all laid out here. And we unfortunately saw the worst of that play out last year in Jackson, Mississippi, a disaster which was decades in the making. Unlike other forms of infrastructure like bridges and roads, clean drinking water isn't, is not primarily funded by taxes. Instead, more than 90% of the average utilities revenues comes directly from constituents' water bills. Ms. Bernard, I commend you for your efforts to secure various forms of federal and state funding, including through a WIFI, a WIFI loan, LIWAP, the SRFs, rate increases, and other sources. But not every water agency is as adept as you've been in Santa Cruz, often due to uh, staff and other capacity challenges. Can you speak to the challenges of accessing funding from so many different sources? And uh, is it time for maybe a new paradigm for how we finance and fund water infrastructure? Thank you for the question, Senator Padilla. Uh, I'd be happy to speak to that question. I, one of the things I think that's really important for us to think about as we uh, think about affordability today and going forward is how are we going to cover these very big costs and for you know spreading out over a relatively small rate base, whether you're one of the rural systems that is uh, was spoken by by one of my colleagues, whether you're a small system spoken uh, by Mr. Jones, these are these are big questions. And even in Santa Cruz, uh, the number I gave you of 650 million for a capital program to rehabilitate, replace, and uh, climate-proof our water utility is a pretty darn big number when you spread it across, across 27,000 accounts. And it, it results in the kind of in rate increases that we've been seeing uh, that are really re creating these problems for our low-income customers. I do think that unlike so much uh, other of our infrastructure, we do need to think about whether or not the business model we're using to fund uh, water utilities, local water utilities is really broken and can get us where we need to go through uh, this next cycle of reinvestment. And if it's not, then what is the right solution? And I think that there needs to be more state and federal funding that comes in to help us with these things. Some of that's loan funding and it's great and we've obviously um, accessed that. We've gone from about 
uh, say, $14 million in debt in 2014 to now um, Santa Cruz has about $370 million in debt and more coming because of the funding strategy. That is a very significant debt burden for a community to uh, take on, and a lot of communities simply won't do it because of fear of how that will uh, require rates to increase. So I think it is time for us to be looking at new paradigms. Thank you. Um, my next question is uh, in the area of the rising costs of water. The graph behind me illustrates how household water and wastewater bills have increased by 160% since 1998. That's a greater rate of growth than electricity bills, rent, or medical bills. The burden of unsafe and unaffordable water disproportionately impacts lower income communities and communities of color. As Mr. Jones shared in his testimony, many rural communities, including tribal communities and farm worker communities, and communities near sites of legacy industrial contamination, in reality pay twice for safe drinking water, once for the contaminated water flowing from their taps, and once again for the costlier bottled water that they must rely on. As the disparity between water rate increases and income growth has increased, so too have household water affordability issues. Mr. Jones, rate payers, especially low-income households, cannot continue to bear the burden of deteriorating infrastructure. Federal investment in water infrastructure has declined by 77% since its peak in the 1970s. How critical, in your opinion, is federal investment in water infrastructure for supporting water affordability? Um, thank you for that. I, I, it's absolutely critical that we continue and expand the overall investment and also prioritize making sure that those investments can reach the communities that need them most that have had the biggest challenges in accessing funding historically. And part of the work we do uh, through some of the expanded community outreach and engagement projects is do the work of organizing community residents to really understand what water solutions are and get them in support of that. A lot of the work we do focuses on consolidations, which honestly is some of the most cost-effective ways to ensure we can build a stronger ratepayer base to be able to cover these costs. And in order to get a consolidation going, you really have to get two communities who have historically not been working together to work together. And that takes a lot of work on the ground. So making sure that the funding sources are being paired with the right types of outreach and engagement can be is absolutely critical to make sure that these solutions that we are funding are, are making uh, the most impact. And then, you know, finally, I think, as we've all said, that there needs to be the focus on affordability when it comes to funding these projects. Because even with some of the, the, the solutions, there's going to be increases in rates. And that's hard for customers, especially if you were a low-income farm worker, undocumented community that, like we work with to understand that this solution comes at a cost. And so making sure we have a program to ensure water is affordable is absolutely critical to make sure that we can get to these solutions for contamination and other issues. Thank you. Senator Lummis. Mr. Pepper, again, thanks for being here. Um, as you know, I've been focused on concerns about PFAS, and I want to ask you about that as well. Um, how are the regulatory requirements from EPA driving up operating costs for water systems? So this is PFAS and other, other ways in which EPA regulations drive up costs. <sighs> Regulatory environment right now is is uh, expanding. Uh, lead copper, the lead copper rule has been revised, re requiring that we get uh, lead service lines out. We all appreciate that that, that has to happen, uh, but it's very expensive, and the amount of money that's been designated for lead line replacements is woefully inadequate. Uh, I think that that you throw in PFAS on top of that. Uh, both at the MCL level as well as at the uh, circular level, and that becomes just a, 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 an unsustainable um, uh, perfect storm. Uh, it just can't, uh, and we all want clean water, uh, and we want safe, affordable drinking water, but there has to be an approach that, that uh, uh, allows that. I, I make the statement a lot, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go on the record. No system in the United States is sustainable on rates alone. It has to include funding from other sources, whether that's other taxes, 
the loan grant programs, uh, all of that. And the, the regulatory environment just adds that additional cost layer. Uh, and a lot of the systems, especially that we work with in Wyoming, uh, you know, with, with the redundant number being under 500 in population, just do not have the expertise to address a lot of that. So that's where our technical assistance comes in and, and helps because we're able to provide uh, that gap, if you will, of people who can fill in and, and do the work, uh, help and, and assist in doing that, uh, as well as um, uh, keeping it affordable because all of our services are provided free of charge to the systems. Uh, but I do think the regulatory environment, if you look at uh, the old public health advisory for PFAS being at 70 parts or 90 parts per trillion, dropping it to four parts. Um, we have had a couple rounds of testing in Wyoming that uh, were done when the protocols were not that great, and so there were a lot of lab errors and whatnot. Uh, but we did have some DTECs uh, uh, at, under the public health advisory level. So uh, were the DTECs at 40 to 70 parts per trillion, or were they at the four parts per trillion? Both. We had some that were uh, detect, and so you have to assume they were low enough uh, to have a detect. And if and something it, is detected, does it have to be addressed? Well, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> we don't know. They're not all the PFAS, PFOA, PFOS compounds cause health issues. Uh, I think they've identified six that have that they're going to try and create the MCL for. Um, our uh, focus on the, the uh, MCL is that it will then cause the tax or the ratepayers to pick up the tab for to cure that violation. Okay, you all. So you mentioned the. MCLs, but you also mention CERCLA. So the, the role of CERCLA in this is uh, that water systems could bear the liability costs, correct? If EPA moves forward with designating certain PFAS compounds as hazardous substances? Correct, and that's, uh, if, if we look at it as a hazardous waste uh, product, uh, the cost to, to do that is, is severe. In Wyoming, the, the closest lab that would be able to do any of that testing is Cincinnati. Uh, so you've got the shipping costs, you've got the hold times, you've got all the issues of lab testing. The closest subtitle C uh, hazardous waste disposal site is in Utah. Uh, and, and thinking of... Uh, and there isn't anything close enough, so I can use this one. Sundance, from Sundance to Salt Lake, is a heck of a trek. Yes, and so all that hazardous material would be uh, expensive as all get out to transport. Uh, and the liability to clean it up then uh, marked as a hazardous waste site would be um, uh, astronomical. And like I, I said, it would probably price those communities out of existence. And normally, under CERCLA, the polluter pays, but if the substance is there and the polluter can't be identified, the rate payer could pay, correct? Correct, correct. And that's where we run into non-point source uh, pollution, uh, when you can't find that person. There are some programs out there, uh, as, I, as indicated, I sit on the governor's non-point source task force. Uh, we're, uh, we do 303D funding uh, and 219 funding uh, to help clean up uh, some of those issues. But uh, the state of Wyoming gets about $700,000 a year from those two programs. It wouldn't touch uh, having to try and do PFAS if that gets thrown into the mix. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, as, uh Everyone can see members have been coming in and out of committee, eagerly uh, trying to time their opportunity to pose questions to our witnesses. Uh, I'll recognize Senator Kelly if he's ready or if he needs a minute. Ready to go. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Um, and Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this uh, hearing on this important topic. You know, certainly for Arizona. 
uh, in California and the West. You know, we are facing um, serious challenges with, with drought and climate change, and our access to renewable or reliable supplies of water and water afford affordability is directly related to these challenges. And as sources of water become more scarce, the price is clearly going to go up. Uh, for example, I live in Tucson, Arizona, where the average water bill increased by 118 percent between 2010 and 2018. In some cases, these increasing water rates can drive more conservation. I've been told it's the one thing that actually works well. But increasing water bills also have a significant impact on households who are living paycheck to paycheck. Folks are really struggling with this. So Ms. Menard, I understand that your community has faced water supply challenges due to drought. How does the city of Santa Cruz balance the challenges of needing to increase uh, rates as water supply costs increase with the need to ensure that water remains affordable to your residents? Thank you for that question, Senator Kelly. Uh, I think the really important thing that we've done in Santa Cruz is acknowledge once we uh, initiated our major capital reinvestment cycle, including sort of the infrastructure side as well as the supply side, that we were potentially going to be impacting, negatively impacting our some of our folks in our community or at least able to pay. And so one of the things that we've done is we have uh, really studied that problem and gone into detail to try to understand not just, you know, what's occurring but what will occur as we continue to make these really necessary reinvestments in systems and, and facilities and supply. I think another thing we've done is we've recently completed a, a metering, uh, an advanced metering infrastructure implementation in our community that has allowed us to help people, particularly focused on low-income customers, look at uh, and be uh, notified immediately when they start having a leak so that we can assist them with getting that leak repaired. Uh, we've redirected our conservation programs. S Santa Cruz has a, a very strong ethic for water conservation, and our customers' uh, indoor and outdoor use it averages about 44 gallons per person per day, which is probably the lowest or near the lowest in the state and maybe lots of other places. But uh, one of the results of that is that we have um, been able to redirect some of our resources internally to supporting this uh, advanced metering infrastructure initiative to communicate to customers immediately when a leak is occurring so that they can get that fixed. We're looking at opportunities to support helping people get those leaks fixed and dealing with the fact that in rentals, for example, the, if the tenant is responsible for the bill that the, um, and then it's not incentivized for the owner to actually pay to fix the leaks. We've been working on some ways to deal with that as well. I recently added one of those to the water meter in my house that'll detect and give you a lot of data on, on water usage. Um, so thank you. And, and Mr. Mr. Jones, one, one way that we can address rising rates for those who have difficulty making ends meet um, is through some federal water assistance programs, and that's why I supported the creation of a water assistance pilot program for rural and low-income communities in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So my remaining time here, Mr. Jones, can you speak to how water affordability assistance programs can help to ensure increasing water rates do not push families into poverty or cause them to lose access to drinking water? Yeah, I think the situation we have right now, and thank you for that, um, in California and across the country is that with water rates ever increasing, that folks are continuing to face shutoffs uh, and losing access to water entirely without assistance. And all we have so far on, established on the federal level is the Low Income uh, Household Water Assistance Program, LIWAP, which is addressing debt and only addressing debt, at least in California, uh, one time. And that could be a big challenge because if you want to, you know, Going through the journey of what it takes for, for you know, a customer, a family, to, to go through the process of having to choose between paying their water bill to avoid shut off or maybe you know, not paying rent or not paying for as much food, uh, that is a challenge that none of us should have to face. Um, and so while it's great that we have debt assistance so far, without a long-term program that actually makes water affordable in the first place, 
uh, folks aren't ever going to be made whole and we're con gonna continue to face challenges. And so I think uh, you know, the support for that pilot and really getting that program going is gonna be absolutely critical to ensure that folks aren't oh, getting shut off as we continue to invest in water and uh, make it safe for all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Senator Ricketts. Uh, thank you, Chairman Padilla and Ranking Member Lummis for uh, holding this hearing today on water affordability. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming here today to, to talk to us about it and for all your support for water infrastructure projects across the country. I have heard from Nebraskans who have concerns about the costs that local water utilities and ratepayers will bear uh, with regard to PFAS monitoring and remediation. I understand the importance of making sure we have clean water for everybody, but uh, the concerns, especially for the cost burden in our rural and more remote water utilities. Uh, I'm gonna ask the entire panel to weigh in on this, but I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Pepper. Um, what tools would be helpful for testing and compliance, especially to water, uh, water infrastructure in rural and remote communities? What are some of the things that these communities could look for? Well, as far as testing goes, and thank you, Senator, for that, um, the access to additional labs would be, would be one thing that we can use uh, with, that would allow uh, for, for more appropriate or um, quick testing, uh, so we know where we are. Uh, PFAS is a, a, uh, a new animal. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but the testing is not where we'd like it to be yet. Uh, I think the, the labs that are starting to do that have uh, indicated that they've gotten much better at, at the detections and being able to isolate which compound they're dealing with. Um, but those are few and far between, and the costs are exorbitant. Uh, we understand some of the PFAS tests can be anywhere from $1,500 to $10,000. Uh, if they're required to be done on a, on a periodic basis uh, or a monthly basis, that could just ruin a small community. Uh, I understand that uh, the treatment, of course, treatment is everything. We don't know what's the best treatment. There's a lot of scientists that are working on uh, methodologies to try and deal with the treatment uh, to remove PFAS or PFAS, PFOA from the drinking water. We don't have it yet, uh, as far as I know, in a, in a usable form. Uh, I've heard that there's, there's some costs in a, I wanna say Pennsylvania may be the state that has a community that did put in a um, uh, UV uh, type reactor uh, that's able to incinerate the PFAS, and, uh, but it was a cost of, I wanna say it was a town of 10,000 and the cost was uh, 25 or $30 million. Uh, we just can't afford it. Uh, so we're, we need a lot of R&D uh, in testing and in treatment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pepper. Ms. Menard? Thank you for that question, sir. One of the things that's going on in Santa Cruz as we're making this massive sort of generational reinvestment in our water system is we are working on a major water, water treatment plant upgrade. Um, our treatment plant is from 1960. It hasn't really had major money put in it since before the 86 amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act. So it does its job now, but it's not going to be the water system, water treatment process for the future. So we're looking at a number of uh, opportunities to use that uh, treatment um, up plan upgrade to prepare us, future-proof our water system against you know, the incremental changes that occur um, in water quality regulations over time. PFAS is one of the issues we're looking at. Obviously, disinfection byproducts is another one that we're working on. Uh, we are looking at granular activated carbon, which is uh, one of the best available technologies that EPA has identified. The issue with that one is not so much a, a huge capital cost, at least not in the system we're looking at. We have about $158 million construction cost for this treatment plant that we're looking at. And the capital for the 
uh, GAC contactors is maybe around uh, five million dollars. So it's not a huge big. It's not nothing, but it's not the hugest uh, part of the deal. Um, but the operating cost of that part of the system is anticipated to increase our ongoing operating cost by potentially as much as 500%. So that is a big issue for us. And I think that one of the things that we're all looking at as we look at these really tiny numbers is how do we best balance that question of what to do with the treatment process uh, versus um, how to make sure that we don't put so much treatment in place and then drive our operating costs, which go on forever, uh, up to a place where, you know, we've maybe balanced one thing, but we've yeah. caused something else. Yeah, great, thank you. Mr. Jones, I'm out of time, so please, can you weigh in just briefly? <laughs> thank you, Senator, I'll be quick. Um, I think a lot of what everyone mentioned, in addition, making sure there's uh, technical assistance for testing out there. We have over 2,700 water systems in California. A lot of them are small and rural. They'll need assistance. And also assistance for domestic wells. We recently, recent studies showed that 40% of pesticides used in California actually end up having PFAS in them. And as that percolates in the groundwater, we need to make sure that everybody's protected, including domestic well owners. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ricketts. You may be out of time with this first round of questions, but we have a second round for additional responses or additional questions. And once again, I get to begin. Um, I, uh, let's see. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, and, and you addressed this in your uh, earlier comments, Ms. Bernard, Congress recognized the risk of impending water shutoffs and growing debt nationwide and provided more than a billion dollars to cover water debt and restore connections for low-income households. Now, to do this, Congress created the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. For folks watching at home, when you hear LIWAP, that's what we're talking about. The first federal program to assist low income families with their water bills. Now that program expires this year, as does the one-time funding provided by Congress to cover water debt. Covers what reconnection services, covers late fees, and reduces water rates. Now, I've advocated for additional funding and an extension of the program as a bridge to a permanent water assistance program that uh, uh, several of you have uh, suggested. Uh, so, Ms. Bernard, I was glad to hear that Santa Cruz participated in LIWAP to help your customers access one time payments and temporary support. What will happen? if LIWAP expires and we don't replace it with a permanent water assistance program? So that's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is that we won't have the one-time funding to help particular you know, people who get in arrears, which uh, if you're low income and you're making this trade-off every month, it's pretty easy when, even once you get the help of uh, having your slate clean to find yourself back there again. Um, but I think that it, we would find ourselves in a situation where uh, shutting people off for non-payment or giving people payment arrangements is something that would become much more frequent. One of the things we've done about just in the last couple of weeks since the COVID era, uh, dis, you know, um, prohibition against disconnections has occurred, uh, actually expired in California, is we have... Uh, had just 50 payment arrangements were set up in just in the last couple of weeks. The average amount of those payment arrangements is $198 a month, which is for 12 months. So that's going to be a really big burden for some uh, one, one who's already struggling to be able to uh, pay in order to clear that arrearage. So I think the bottom line for us is that we would have a lot more people facing shutoffs for non-payment. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, brief response if, if you would. Do you think it makes sense that we have a permanent energy assistance program in LIHEAP? I referenced that earlier, mm. but not a permanent program for water? Absolutely not. We need support for water assistance. Okay. Anybody disagree with that? All right. Thank you. Uh, let the record reflect. All witnesses have nodded no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one additional question, I'll uh, recognize Senator Lemus again. Uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Pepper, both of you in your written testimonies discussed the challenges that small rural or disadvantaged water systems face to develop solutions and create needed projects to deliver and to treat water. And that's just to develop the pipeline of projects that could potentially receive federal or state funding. You discuss issues related to economies of scale 
and the lack of large ratepayer base to spread costs. Could you each expand on the challenges that communities face in accessing infrastructure dollars and what are some of the solutions uh, that you've seen, particularly if it sheds light on what Congress can do uh, to help in this uh, regard? Uh, thank you. Uh, so some of the challenges we're facing, like I said, a lot of Prime's projects need a lot more technical assistance in order to not only understand what a long-term solution is that works for the community, but also uh, gets community support and buy-in, which is absolutely critical. And I think the famous story in California is about Lanier, California. That's a community that faced arsenic in their drinking water. And they were uh, funded a treatment project for that community. But unfortunately, because it wasn't right-sized for the community, that project was shuttered when the community couldn't afford operations and maintenance costs. One thing we're doing in California is looking at starting to fund operations and maintenance for certain projects to actually make it so that solutions are affordable for communities. And so I think going forward, that's got to be part of the conversation to figure out how uh, making sure that communities are able to run systems is, is part of the solution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in Wyoming, I know we have a myriad of funding programs in addition to uh, the federal programs, the, the state revolving funds. I, I think the state revolving funds were a great uh, uh, addition to the funding mechanisms, uh, giving the states the opportunity to design their own rules and regs around the uh, SRFs is, is critical. Uh, every state is a little different, which does make it a little tough to go from state to state to state, which makes in-state uh, uh, technical assistance so critical. Uh, but I do think that, that uh, uh, some of the timelines that come with that funding uh, need to be addressed and need to be looked at a little bit differently. Uh, like I said, the, the SRF, the infrastructure bill, uh, some of those funding sources and, and timelines are just unrealistic given the supply chain issues, given the uh, technical abilities of, of having enough engineers and contractors who can do the work, uh, and then also having the workforce uh, that can then maintain it after everything's all done. Uh, I know the, uh, my second round five minutes are up, but if you'll indulge me, I have one specific follow-up question uh, for Mr. Jones. Uh, and I believe it's a timely one. Uh, as we speak, I believe the uh, House of Representatives is taking up this uh, debt limit deal. Mm -hmm. Now, the debt limit deal uh, currently under consideration rescinds unobligated LIWAP funds from the American Rescue Plan. Now, funds to states and tribes have all been obligated. That's the good news. But this will impact the HHS budget for staff time and for expenses. So how will this impact, uh, question for Mr. Jones, the ability of communities to implement their LIWAP funds if HHS has decreased capacity for staffing? I think it's certainly gonna pose a challenge. Um, in California, there's been a lot of conversation between uh, our state agencies that are implementing the program and HHS, and a lot of assistance coming from HHS on how to better structure California's pro program. And unfortunately, California hasn't been as successful as other states in getting funding out the door. Um, and, and so certainly making sure that, that HHS has the ability to support states in getting resources to families is gonna be absolutely critical. I think secondly, there's a lot of important work being done on reporting and getting data out there so that we can understand who is doing what work and why. And as I look to think about how California could do a better job, I see you know, states like uh, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan doing fantastic, and that makes me wanna learn about them. And, and so I worry that if we're not gonna have that ability to, to data share and staff to help, that uh, we're not gonna be able to improve upon the program and the model of delivery and going forward. Thank you, I just wanna underscore that because I think part of the, the dynamic we're facing here for, for small, for rural, uh, for resource limited water utilities and communities, uh, sometimes reliance on the federal government for some of that technical assistance and support is part of getting to a solution. So if that's limited on the federal side, separate and apart from a dollar, a grant, or a, a, a favorable loan, uh, this uh, is, is hurting more than it's helping. Senator Lummis, thank you for your patience. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I have a question for Ms. Menard. Yeah, my line of questioning for Mr. Pepper dealt mostly with maximum contaminant limits and CERCLA. Could you address that question, those questions as well, please, from your community's perspective? Thank you, yes. Um, I think the CERCLA question in our community is mostly on the wastewater side. And to some degree, we, we, have, um, we have it in our surface water, but at a really, really low level. So I'm not too concerned about the CERCLA issues for solids coming from the water treatment plant, but obviously we're looking at that. But also, the, it's on the wastewater side is one of the places where the CERCLA liability is really getting looked at because they obviously get water coming from households and businesses, and th those sources can often have other additional adds of the PFAS. Um, I think that on the, the question of the impacts I mentioned in my uh, earlier comments about looking at uh, granular activated carbon and its capital cost plus its operating cost, uh, that does potentially represent a, a long-term concern. But I also know that uh, it's really important in my community for there to be a, a strong commitment and strong action on improving the quality and, and being good stewards of the quality of the, the treated water that's delivered. So in my community, we have a strong preference for doing what we can to make uh, to deal with these issues that come, including other uh, constituents of emerging concern, pharmaceuticals, per personal care products, those kinds of things that fall in the uh, source waters that we use and those things are being planned for as part of our treatment plan upgrade. Thank you. Um, I also, there are other committee hearings going on this afternoon. We have some members of the committee that are elsewhere but wanted some questions asked for the record. Uh, this one for uh, Mr. Pepper. Uh, there are concerns within the water sector that funding decisions that are prioritizing environmental justice factors are unrelated to water quality and health. Um, this could potentially impact the affordability of water services for rural communities, which already face unique challenges such as limited funding, technical expertise, and resources. The question is this, um, do you believe the emphasis on non-water infrastructure policies and potential biases that are related to environmental justice decision-making might affect affordability of water ser uh, services in rural areas? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and I, I guess from the West and, and, and from uh, my perspective, a lot of the, the issue that we have is defined disadvantaged or environmental justice centers or, or uh, constituents. And, and I would contend that a lot of rural America, uh, whether it's northeast, south, or west, uh, works with those. We have a declining population base in a lot of those areas, uh, which further puts strain on affordability uh, in those small communities, uh, aging communities, uh, and, and disadvantaged, I believe, can, can be socioeconomic. And that, that crosses all races uh, and goes into uh, how do we look at that on a countrywide basis uh, as opposed to certain pockets. So yes, some of those biases I think can play into the affordability index uh, and, and makes it far difficult to define more than anything. You know, the question comes from someone who is concerned that environmental justice is being used as a term to steer resources towards low-income urban areas at the expense of uh, rural areas. Ms. Mr. Jones, do you see that? We don't, I haven't seen that so much in California. Um, I think the, the communities we work with are certainly both rural and environmental justice communities. Uh, and so we, as you deform rural, so you dis, distinguish, you separated. There's rural and there's environmental justice communities. And and a community could be could be both, um, okay. for sure. And I think you know, and maybe that you know the the, the disadvantaged community definition we use in California is eighty percent eighty percent state 
statewide income level. And so certainly for the Valley and areas that we tend that we primarily work in, most communities are able to qualify, um, unfortunately, just because of the, the, the level of income inequality in the state. Okay. Uh, but I haven't seen so much of a dynamic there in California, at least. Uh, Mr. Pepper, any closing remarks on that point? I think he hit it very well in that, that uh, uh, it just depends on, on the, the level of income in any area. You know, in our state of Wyoming, there's, there's several counties that are, are impacted in low income, uh, but define lower income. A lot of those are ag-related, uh, so there's a different um, uh, accounting uh, in an ag business than there is in, in residential. Uh, so I think there's, again, it comes back down to definitions. And, and I would say that, that it does appear in some respects, even in Wyoming, some of the, the uh, urban uh, thrust versus the rural thrust is, is there. So that, that should be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I want to thank the witnesses for attending today and providing your expertise to the subcommittee. Thank you uh, to, uh, to you, Senator Lemus, and to our witnesses, uh, once again, for being here today and for sharing your experiences uh, and to help us improve the lives of countless Americans who are still struggling to afford something as fundamental as their water. Again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Carper uh, and Ranking Member Capito, uh, as well as our subcommittee staff for all the preparation that went into uh, holding this today's hearing, which I think, just for the record, that we've established a success. Now, in the end, we can't be truly an equal society. We can't truly call ourselves a compassionate country, and no one can truly pursue life, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness unless every family has the dignity of safe drinking water and proper sanitation. So the issue of water affordability in America could not be more important and more timely. That's why it's been a defining feature of many of the major funding bills that Congress has passed over the last few years. We've recognized the problem of deteriorating infrastructure, rising prices, and an economic crunch and we've stepped in to help the American people. That's the good news. But the bad news is, as we've heard from our witnesses today, we still have much more work to do. What we heard from Mr. Jones, for example, should leave no doubt families are still struggling to stay afloat. And while recent laws have made a difference, one-time assistance is not a solution for a family sitting at the kitchen table deciding between the next grocery store trip or next month's water bill. And unfortunately, as we learned from Ms. Menard and Mr. Pepper, the conditions of our aging infrastructure, combined with the increasingly devastating effects of climate change and the challenges posed by emerging contaminants, including PFAS, mean that none of this will be resolved on its own. Congress needs to step up. But I'm hopeful uh, the previously approved water assistance funding and the permanent energy utility assistance programs that I referenced earlier today have enjoyed bipartisan support. Congress has recognized the threat of rising cost of home energy bills. So in 1980, we established a permanent low-income home energy assistance program for families in need. There's no reason why we can't do the same for water rate assistance. I believe we can and we must come together in a bipartisan fashion to make these meaningful investments. Countless families across the country are counting on us to do just that because for them, this isn't just about policy. It's about the dignity of having clean water to wash your dishes and bathe your children. It's about the peace of mind knowing your kids have clean water to drink at school. And it's about making sure that every American, no matter the zip code or your paycheck, has access to safe, affordable water. Before we adjourn, just a bit of housekeeping. Senators will be allowed to submit written questions for the record by 4 p.m. on Wednesday, June 14th, which is two weeks from today. We will compile those questions, send them to our witnesses, who we will ask to reply by Wednesday, June 28th. I want to thank you all again for being here this afternoon. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.